many college campuses feel more like an icy lake these days with one wrong step leading to total disaster? Both students and faculty have felt the chill in the air. Anti-free speech students and staff perfectly willing to launch campus pogroms against perceived dis uh, dissenters. But with the rise of DEI initiatives formally codified into many college admissions and staff selection processes, these issues have become even worse. As Greg Lukianoff writes, universities use DEI statements to enforce groupthink and remove ideological diversity from campus. Most frighteningly, Lukianoff and his co-author on his new book, Ricky Schlott, detail a supposed gauntlet of DEI and ideological purity tests that weed out anyone but the most devout believers at each step of the process. But some are concerned that campuses are weaponizing safetyism, safety concerns, or academic critiques as an excuse to remove politically inconvenient actors from schools. Harvard's Claudine Gay was touted as being anti-free speech, even though she was only in the position for less than a year, far more likely than arguments of academic integrity or free speech issues. In fact, it was likely that her refusal to say that she would censor anti-Israel speech was the reason she got the boot. Here to discuss further is Greg Lukianoff, author of a piece in Reason, uh, my magazine about these issues, and president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression, and author of the new book, The Canceling of the American Mind. Thank you so much for being on, Greg. I think I noted everything I wanted to note there. Um, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So we want to talk about uh, DEI on college campuses and threats to free speech, which is the subject of the piece you wrote and, and has a lot to do with your book. Um, this is something that a lot of people on the right are talking about um, these days, and I think getting some pushback from others about, well, is it really a problem? Is it really threatening free speech? Why don't you give us an overview of you know, what, what do you mean by DEI? What is actually going on, and where does it intersect with uh, censorship? Sure. Um, so I, I've been doing this for 22 years, to almost, actually almost 23 years now. And the biggest threat to free speech on, on college campuses has been the bureaucracy on campus, has been the administrators, uh, which is one of the reasons why kids are paying so much to go to these schools uh, these days, by the way. So they should be angry enough about that. Uh, DEI administrators are just a subset of the administrators who create problems, um, and, but they've only been calling themselves DEI administrators for a relatively short period of time. And in that time, we've seen some of the worst threats to academic freedom I'm aware of. Um, so for, uh, to give one very, the, the biggest example that's going on right now, uh, at FIRE, my organization, we, de we defeated the Stop Woke Act that came out of the DeSantis administration, um, which, which targeted uh, actually in some cases teaching uh, ideas related to DEI. Um, and that was a threat from the right. But a far, and we defeated it in court so far, it's on appeal. Uh, but a far worse threat that we've seen, which gets virtually no coverage, which is outrageous, is in the California Community College System, where professors, doesn't matter if you're chemistry or physics, are actually required to work in DEI concepts, everything from intersectionality to anti-racism, into their classrooms, even if they teach science, for example. This is unbelievably unconstitutional, but it doesn't get nearly enough attention. You know, one interesting aspect of this is that Bill Ackman, who, of course, led the fight against Claudine Gay, criticized what he believed to be some kind of diversity, equity and inclusion style framing. Um, there was a lot of argument. To, uh, there were many arguments that Claudine Gay was not qualified for her position, obviously, with the plagiarism scandal, et cetera. But when the script was flipped and Bill Ackman's wife was accused of plagiarism, he felt very differently about whether or not that disqualified you for certain kinds of jobs. And more pointedly, he has been arguing that Jewish people need to be included within Harvard's DEI framework, seemingly because he sees, as you're describing, some benefit in being able to weaponize those policies in advancement of his own political views, which are very much pro-Israel. Is that the kind of thing that you're, you're talking about here? Well, I'm saying that we need to massively de-bureaucratize higher education if we want it to be less expensive. And the idea of just adding Jewish students to the DEI structure is foolishness. Hmm. Do you, what are some other examples of how DEI is interfering in students' rights on campus? Can you talk to us about DEI um, statements, something that I know uh, uh, many oh, faculty yeah. in surveys um, say that they're concerned about? What, what is that? So I got pretty badly depressed writing Canceling of the American Mind, <laughs> looking at all the different threats to free speech and academic freedom, both on and off campus, but particularly on campus. 
And uh, and if you factor in, you know, the low level of viewpoint diversity that you have in higher ed today, that's already a problem. But this whole article that I wrote for for reason, it's just uh, that, that's based on a chapter in the book that Ricky and I wrote. It's just conformity inducing pressure after conformity inducing pressure after conformity inducing pressure. When you already have, I think it's what three percent of professors at Harvard uh, self describing as, as as conservative, and you know, smaller numbers at some schools, virtually none in some departments. To add on top of that, something that is a political a litmus test, which which DAI statements can uh, obviously are, but also at the same time we did an experiment to prove that they are, uh, which, which we talk about in the book. Um, it just seems insane. So Fire actually came out with a proposed law um, several months ago uh, opposing uh, McCarthyite uh, political litmus tests. So basically saying like if you had an essay saying patriotism, you know, like give your thoughts on patriotism, that would be a political litmus test. And just the same way DEI statements are as well. But the idea that these same administrators looked at the environment on campus in the past few years and said to themselves, you know what, there's too much independence of thought on campus. We need some additional political litmus test is just completely nuts. I want to talk specifically about uh, some of the the proliferation of uh, anti-speech um, uh, efforts on university campuses that has happened in the last few months. It's worth noting that the University of Pennsylvania professor McGill, who was ousted after those congressional Senate hearings about anti-Semitism on campus, of course, that was in the beginning of the campaign against her. Uh, her first uh, real challenge happened over organizing this Palestine Rights Literature Festival, which uh, yep. Jewish students objected to and the Jewish community objected to uh, because it included uh, Pink Floyd's Roger Waters, who they characterize as being anti-Semitic. I would push back against those characterizations, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, and of course, uh, there were, was a screening of a documentary, Critical of Israel, yeah. that was banned at the University of Pennsylvania. At Brandeis University, a pro-Palestinian group was barred for statements made by its national chapter. We've seen a lot of these pro-Palestinian groups banned uh, across campuses entirely in the wake of October 7th. Um, and on, at the University of Vermont, a Palestinian poet was set to deliver a talk. This is from the New York Times. But the school pulled the meeting space after students complained that he was anti-Semitic. We've seen uh, writers, uh, speakers that were planned to speak at the 92nd Street Y pulled. We've seen a number of professors um, threatened with their livelihood. Obviously, Bill Ackman, again, um, supported releasing lists of all of the students that were members of groups, even if they personally didn't sign objectionable statements, uh, and joined ranks with other very powerful billionaires, like the Sweet Green billionaire, to say, release these lists to make sure that these people are never hired after they graduate. And, and I'm struggling. I, I, take your, I take your critique of DEI and how it can be mm -hmm. weaponized in these various ways, but I'm struggling to see how all of these kinds of events, which seem to me a really significant problem on college campuses right now, are connected to the DEI framing we've offered here. The um, it, it, that's why I open up talking about administrators when it comes to and by the way, pretty much all of the cases you've mentioned are fire cases. We, we've written almost three dozen letters on behalf of of students um, for, for their, what they said or, or and professors for that matter on the on the Palestine Hamas war. And it definitely is the case the pro Palestinian speech is more likely to get you in trouble uh, uh, over the last uh, s several months uh, that, that we've seen. So I do think that the the way that the DEI, um, you know, administrators play into this, you know, oftentimes are, you know, sometimes uh, they are actually the ones making the decision to get the to to get these students published or, or punished or the professors punished. Um, and so I, I do think that there is it's been weird since DEI, you know, is perceived as being kind of like uh, overwhelmingly, like on on the left, there does tend to be sort of an instinct on the left to sort of defend it. But I think that in a lot of cases, the left unwittingly is putting itself in the defense of these institutions that actually perpetuate class privilege, that actually become increasingly expensive, don't really care about keeping costs down so students can attend, while at the same time cr uh, uh, clamping down on speech they don't like, which discredits them to everyone else. Yeah, what's interesting is I think actually the left critique of DEI or I wouldn't frame it as DEI, I think it's much broader than that. I think it's a generalized weaponization of identity is a status quo preserving tool. And the left critique is that any kind of HR and DEI, these institutions is simply HR, is in place to protect the company from lawsuits, not because it has any higher goal of um, 
changing the discourse or protecting student thought or anything like that. So to that extent, I agree with you, but it does seem that because DEI is the status quo preserving mechanism, that it is not in fact a left mechanism at all, to your point. Mm -hmm. And that what we see at these colleges like Harvard University is that ultimately Claudine Gay was not some free speech hero or some advocate on behalf of Palestinian students. She simply tried to toe a line that was a little bit contrary to what the kind of billionaire donor class at Harvard University wanted. And because they threatened to withdraw money, she lost support of the board and ultimately was fired. I see that not as a function of DEI, whatever the criticisms of it are, but of moneyed interest using their power at these institutions to advance a very specific ideology. And these moneyed interests, by the way, would probably describe themselves as liberal in a generalized sense, but they're liberals who are also very much uh, Zionist as opposed to a kind of more moderated take that uh, Claudine Gay was offering here. I, I mean, I'm actually really relieved to hear you say that because I, one thing that I find absolutely mind blowing, uh, like in, in the treatment of of Harvard uh, in the media in the past couple months, is this big defense of it as if they're not defending one of the biggest, richest mega corporations with sixty billion dollars to one side that perpetuates class privilege but also to the extent to which it wants to maintain the status quo, it is also trying to maintain its ideological status quo, which is very much, in my opinion, a upper class uh, sort of uh, a view of the world that actually tells people at Harvard that they are the best of the best and the brightest of the brightest, um, and that they're more moral than other people. Can you, uh, before we let you go, uh, FIRE, I, and I cite your organization all the time, it's a terrific, very principled free speech organization, ranks Harvard dead last on, on campuses they are in free that. speech policies. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and, and some of the other, uh, MIT and, and Penn also ranking very lowly. Can you tell, uh, give us a little bit of the rationale, the criteria that your organization goes through when it determines that this is a school with terrible free speech policies? Oh, sure, sure. It's not just their policies, it's their practices as well. And to be clear, the, the uh, our, our campus free speech ranking, before you send your kid to any school, be sure to consult our campus free speech ranking because it's the largest, it relies on the largest survey of student opinion on whether or not you can speak on a particular campus ever done. The four largest databases on professor cancellations, student cancellations, uh, speech code policies, and deplatforming. We take on both the left and the right um, in that, but Harvard really did earn its originally negative score. It was a <laughs> negative 11 point something or 10.69. Um, that we rounded up to zero. Right behind it was Pennsylvania. Was University of Pennsylvania, um, and above that, by the way, University of South Carolina. So, so sometimes, like when it comes to the sort of uh, uh, sort of predictable ways of, of figuring out, you know, based on a partisan lens of how you think it would it, it would pan out, it doesn't it doesn't work out that way. So, for example, University of Virginia does really well, but most interestingly, not surprising to me, also getting back to sort of a class perspective. Michigan Technological University in, in, in Michigan is actually the one that finished first. Uh, just out of curiosity, it, it's surprising to me, these results, given that, of course, institutions like BYU or Lincoln University, religious institutions that don't allow things like holding hands on campus, not being a Christian on campus, um, mm -hmm. really are really pretty restricted. And of course, people make choices to go to that school. I'm not criticizing the school itself, but they're obviously yeah. objectively much less free in terms of what you're able to say and do on campus than an institution like Harvard. How are those kinds of things factored in in a way that would not put one of those universities that literally limits your speech in very specific and stated ways lower than a place like Harvard University? And I guess my follow-up is, how much is your ranking based on students' subjective reports? Because it could be that students at Harvard or more keyed in to the idea that they should have certain speech rights and therefore are more critical of their university, so let's say over their attitude to pro-Palestinian pro speech, than students at a place like BYU might be. Schools that make it clear that they place other things above their uh, identity, um, the Christian schools, BYU, et cetera, we call warning schools. Um, and what the warning is, is don't go there if you want your free speech protected. These are schools that have made it pretty clear that, that you don't have uh, these rights there. 
whereas private liberal arts colleges overwhelmingly have uh, promised freedom of speech and academic freedom to be protected, and we hold them to those promises. And while the idea that kind of like, oh, maybe it's just something different about Harvard, maybe they're just more aware of stuff, that doesn't explain why University of Chicago is 13th. That doesn't explain why UVA um, is in the top 10. What, one of the things that just has been true in my long career is that elite colleges are worse on freedom of speech. They are less tolerant, more group thinky, um, and they are the kind of schools that I no longer advise people to go to, um, with a couple of exceptions, including University of Chicago. Hmm. The University of, okay, with the exception of University of Chicago, you're saying that's the one good elite school. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, there are other, I, 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 I thought University of Virginia's elite. Sure. All right. Brianna's a Harvard girl over here, so we're all. Uh, oh, I know. <laughs> I mean, I just. <laughs> but, I, just but, I, but I appreciate and, you seeing through the sort of class uh, class lens on it, because a lot of Harvard graduates can't even see that. Yeah. Well, you know, I I think I think the issue. I mean, there's so much to unpack here. University of Chicago has a reputation for being actually affirmative, very uh, affirmatively conservative, not in terms of political speech. I think this is a that's dis that, distinction. That's, that's just false. That that well, that, but, that does not come out in the polling. That does not that does not come out in the in the makeup thought, of, of of their. Uh, if no, I could but just it's just it's not true. My thought, but you don't know what I'm saying yet. It's really hard to disagree no, but you're, with but someone. You're, but what you're, what, what you're doing is a very typical uh, tactic, which is like, oh, but those are, those guys are right wingers. When the evidence I, of I didn't University say those Chicago words, right and I would really appreciate no, 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 it if is, you could allow me to finish. If you're not afraid of speech, ludicrous. I think you should allow me to finish my point before you object to it. Isn't that no, kind of the game okay. here? Um, Go on. Not in terms of generalized public political speech, what's going on in the world, those kinds of things, which I think is the focus of a lot of these conversations. And I think there's pretty much uniformity across colleges on those issues because most young people have a left-leaning political bent. That's just the reality of the world. However, I think what's much more important about at these colleges in particular, personally, is that at Harvard and New University of Chicago and all of these institutions, what is taught in the hard sciences in um, law and business, which graduate most of the professional world uh, coming out of these colleges, have a very, not socially conservative, but substantively economically conservative worldview. So when you're talking about these institutions preserving elite class status, I think that's absolutely true, but that gets ignored because there's more of a focus on whether or not a given professor identifies as a Democrat or a liberal, as opposed to whether or not they teach a form of economics or a form of legal theory that is necessarily status quo preserving and preserving of our institutions, generally speaking, which is why you see so many Harvard grads in the Supreme Court, in government, and all behaving in concert with each other, regardless of whether or not they have a D or an R after their name. I'll give you a chance to respond. Uh, it was just a statement. I, what, what, what's the... What, you don't have to. Look, we appreciate you coming here and giving your view. Thank you so much.